Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Valerie Amos. I'm the director uh, here at SOAS, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome so many of you uh, this evening for our SOAS centenary lecture. And a very warm welcome to those watching from around the world. We're live streaming uh, tonight's lecture on Facebook. The SOAS Centenary Lecture Series features lectures by high-profile individuals on subjects that are very close to the SOAS mission. We've already welcomed, for example, Wale Soyinka and Forrest Whitaker, and we'll be hosting others as part of uh, the series, including Hina Jalani and Mohammed El Baradai. My job is to tell you a little bit about uh, SOAS before we move into the introduction of tonight's very special guest. Here at SOAS, we are very proud of our diversity with students from over 130 countries. We see ourselves as being about building bridges across cultures and communities with a global perspective at the very heart of our approach. Our history and events such as this one tonight demonstrate the important space that SOAS provides for debate, discussion, and asking the challenging questions about how we look at our world. And that is why, for our centenary year, we've launched a campaign called Questions Worth Asking. For us, it's important that our students and academics can keep on asking, and indeed answering, today's most pressing questions. For example, is there a solution to the world's refugee crisis? What happens after war? Should we all speak the same language? What makes a global citizen? Will there ever be equality? For a hundred years, we've been asking searching questions, and through this campaign, we're seeking further support for our work, for example, uh, so that we can uh, have students from around the world who, without scholarships, for example, could not afford to come to SOAS for academic projects and for endowed posts, for making sure that we put the student experience right at the heart of everything that we do. And you can learn more about our campaign by going on to uh, the SOAS website, uh, soas.ac.uk slash questions. So let me turn now specifically to tonight. We have a newly founded SOAS student and alumni-led social enterprise, Stories on Our Plate, which is using food to challenge the marginalization of refugees living in the United Kingdom. Central to Stories on Our Plate is a culinary training program for refugees aimed at overcoming the many barriers refugees face to entering careers in the food and catering industries. Celebrating our differences through the shared experience of sharing food underlines the stories on our plate philosophy. And it's a key part of tonight's lecture. Food is culture. And you can find out more uh, of the work of our students and our alumni. Uh, they will have a stall upstairs in the Brunei suite after the lecture. A couple of final practical things uh, before I hand over. Please turn your mobile phones to silent. Um, we want you to tweet like mad, so we don't want you to turn them off, but please turn them to silent. And when you do tweet, and note I say when, not if, uh, please use the hashtag SOAS100. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Klein, who's the chair of our Food Studies Center, who is going to introduce tonight's very special guest. So put your hands together and give a rousing welcome to Claudia Roden.
Claudia Rodin's first cookbook, A Book of Middle Eastern Food, was published in 1968. At the time, she had already been living in England for over a decade. Born in Cairo in 1936, she was raised there until the age of 15 in a predominantly French-speaking but polyglot Sephardic Jewish family with links to Aleppo and Istanbul. She completed her schooling in Paris and then London, where she studied as a Martin School of Art. Following the 1956 Suez Crisis and the war between Egypt and, and Israel, the family had to leave Cairo, and her parents, too, came to live in London. A book of Middle Eastern food draws heavily on recipes shared by family members and friends living in exile in England and around the world, as well as on library research and field research in London among people from all over the Middle East. It was, as Claudia later writes in a revised and expanded edition of the book, A Labor of Love, written by a young woman enthralled by her discoveries of her own lost culture. The book soon became a bestseller and was described by the renowned American cookbook writer and early television chef, James Beard, as a landmark in the field of cookery. Its success has been followed by five decades of cookbook writing, research, and promotions of culinary scholarship. Her many, often multiple award-winning books include Mediterranean Cookery, which was published in 1987 in connection with the BBC television series Mediterranean Cookery with Claudia Rodin, The Food of Italy, first published in 1989, The Book of Jewish Food, an odyssey from Samarkand to, and Vilna to the present day, first published in 1996, Tamarind and Saffron, favorite recipes from the Middle East from 2000, Arabesque, sumptuous food from Morocco, Turkey, and Lebanon from 2005, and most recently from 2012, the food of Spain. Throughout her work, Claudia Rodin combines subtle reflections on personal experiences and family histories with meticulous, wide-ranging historical and ethnographic scholarship. Through her recipes, and culinary ethnography, she explores the complex histories of migration and settlement, unities and diversities, connections, ruptures, and reconnections that have shaped the, that have shaped the people and cultures of the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and Europe. Through the media of food and words, Claudia Rodin invites readers, cooks, and eaters not just to learn about these histories of division and connection, but more profoundly to taste them and smell them, to make sense of them, and in this way, to make them a part of their own life experiences. This invitation is reflected and warmly responded to in an anonymous reader's Amazon review of a new book of Middle Eastern cuisine, a revised version of Claudia's first cookbook. And I quote, I am a Turkish woman, and most of the recipes Rodin explains in her marvelous book are no strangers to me. I have been living abroad now for many years. Every time I open Rodin's book, I can smell my grandmother's kitchen. Here is a personal thank you to Claudia Rodin from me. Mashallah, 41 times, as we say back home. Claudia Rodin was awarded a SOAS Honorary Fellowship in 2012. In an interview conducted for the occasion, Professor Denise Candiotti of SOAS declared, it would be fair to say that Claudia Rodin, by opening a window on patterns of conviviality and cuisine in the Middle East, has done more for an understanding of the region 
than most area specialists. She has used history, oral narratives, and interviews to build a phenomenal corpus of knowledge on the Levant, the Mediterranean, and beyond in a way that illuminates cultural continuities and the circulation of people and ideas. She has also popularized her work through numerous high profile media appearances and her service on important boards, such as the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development in the Netherlands. She is a celebrity in the best sense of the word, using her high profile to promote deeper understanding of Middle Eastern cultures. Ladies and gentlemen, director, it is a great honor and immense pleasure to welcome this evening's SOAS Centenary Lecturer, Claudia Rodin. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie, for inviting me to speak. Thank you, Jacob, for the very kind introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm honored and very happy to be associated with SOAS and the Center of Food Studies. I get to hear about the wonderful work that's going on, and I can come to some of the events. I was asked to speak about the role of food in culture. Everything. I was a bit scared when I was asked <laughs> because I felt I'm not an academic. Anyway, I can, from what I hear, it's my experiences that I'll be talking about as well. But I start by saying everything to do with food, from agriculture, animal husbandry, hunting and fishing, to the way we cook and eat is culture. And cooking is especially important because it impacts on everyday life for everybody. Taste is the most personal of our senses, but it's acquired and cultivated in society. Our comfort foods can reveal our provenance and ethnicity, our religion, ideology, aspirations, and even our place in society. Taste is, um, yes. Well, food is about sustenance and pleasure but it's also about hospitality and conviviality and creating bonds between people. I come from a society where to entertain a guest is the greatest joy and where hospitality and offering food is an all important part of life. Among the happy memories of my childhood in Egypt, <coughs> in Egypt are the times when we sat on long extended tables the grown-ups at one end, the children at, an other, and at the other, and when we did the rounds visiting relatives on festive occasions, we arrived in a house and found everybody of the extended family sitting in a large circles. We kissed everybody, and depending on the time of day, we were served Turkish coffee with spoon jams, mezes, or pastries. I realized that recipes uh, well, the um, recipes was about roots and identity when I first started collecting them. It was in 1956 when the Jews had to leave Egypt suddenly en masse after Suez. I was an art student in London and my parents arrived as refugees. We were inundated with family and friends passing through on their way to other homelands. Everyone was exchanging recipes in a desperate kind of way. Give me your recipe for lahma be'ajin, please. Your kibbeneye, your hummus, the date preserve. I might never see you again. It will be something to remember you by. Some took out little handwritten notebooks and we sat down together to go through them. In Egypt, we would never have given me a recipe. Nobody would. There had never be, there hadn't been any cookbooks, but recipes were jealously kept in families and not given away except with at least one or two mistakes. <laughs> but now we all wanted to preserve something that had made our lives happy in our new, uh, in what was a vanished world. Uh, it was such a strange thing of thinking we'll never see Egypt again and we'll never see each other again. 
Uh, now, the recipes were a mixed bag because Egypt had been a cosmopolitan society with many minorities, and the Jewish community itself was a mosaic of families from all over the Ottoman Empire and beyond. My grandparents came from Aleppo and Istanbul. The women who gave me the recipes said they were always from their mothers or their grandmothers. And they would say, from Aleppo, from Izmir. She was from Istanbul. She was from Tunis or Baghdad or Livorno. And now these recipes were their badge of identity and they were very proud of them. They also added bits of information and stories how, as children, they were given the task to make lisan alasfur. These are bird's tongues. Here we call them orzo. I made them on Sunday. And it was all, uh, as children, they were given the task to roll tiny bits of pasta as ov ovals uh, of dough between their fingers. Some, somebody told me, do you know uh, how, in the Jewish quarter, we put the, our pans of broad beans, of full medamets, and hard-boiled eggs to cook in the ashes of the fire at the public baths on Friday night and collected them on Saturday. Uh, when years later, I eventually put the recipes in a book. I wrote in my introduction that the book was the joint creation of numerous Middle Easterners who, like me, are in exile, either forced or voluntary, and it, that it was the fruit of the, their nostalgic longings for and delighted savorings of a food that was the constant joy of life in a world so different from the Western one. And I added that the saying, the dancer dies and does not forget the shaking of his shoulders, applied to us. Actually, that saying came from a collection of sayings and proverbs that my uncle Musa was collecting while I was collecting recipes. <laughs> it was melodramatic, but it had impressed me. Now, the French writer Edgar Morin, a, new, a Jew from Salonica, explained the importance of food for his community in his book Vidal et les Siens. Vidal and his people. Gastronomy, he wrote, is the kernel of a culture, and that for Salonicas, for Salonicans, pastelicos is the kernel of the kernel. For some, he said, pastelicos is all that is left of their culture. Actually, pastelicos are little pies filled with minced meat and fried onions, cinnamon, and allspice. And the same lady who gave me the orange cake gave me the recipe for pastelicos. She was my, my sister-in-law's grandmother. Now, every community has their own pastelicos. When I visited my aunt, Yvette, in Los Angeles, she always immediately opened the freezer and brought out kibbe, sambusek, and baba ranoush. And, and uh, she just said, well, that's what we're having, of course, every time. Now, these are the foods that millions of Syrian refugees yearn for today. Uh, now, to refugees and immigrants, food is a link with the past. It's that part of their culture that survives the longest, passed on from one generation to another, kept up when clothing, language, and music have been dropped. It's also the way that an immigrant community insinuates its culture in a new homeland, because cooking does not require capital. Different groups of immigrants to this country have brought great gastronomic en uh, enrichments. London once was uh, not the best place to eat. I, my, I, was I had written an awful place to eat, but my son-in-law told me, you can't say awful. But just now, <laughs> Valerie told me, you can say awful. <laughs> because she was here in the 60s, and it was. <laughs> it was gray and beige, and uh, it didn't have any taste. It was very limited. And in the canteens at art school and my brother's um, medical school, it was worse than awful, I have to say. Well. 
because it's all changed, we can say this. Now, now London is, is, the, uh, is a gastronomic capital of the world where every type of restaurant is represented. The Indian and Chinese meals have long been part of the English way of life. We are now used to Lebanese, Turkish, Greek, Mexican, and many other types of meals, including sushi and the Middle Eastern meze. Chicken tikka masala was the nation's most popular dish, eclipsing fish and chips until the much hotter jalfrezi became the new fa favorite. A recent survey relieve, revealed that 41% of British households have hummus in their fridge. <laughs> now, of course, it's not the real hummus. <laughs> More about it later. Uh, our modern English um, menus in restaurants and gastro pubs are full of bulgur and couscous, now furike, tahini, pomegranate molasses, harissa, and preserved lemon, a multitude of spices, rose water, and chili. Um, yes, uh, well, we've made all these things our own and use them to create something uniquely ours, a fusion cuisine that represents the interweaving of cultures. Now, food connects us not only with family and society, but with history and geography. I became aware that dishes had history behind them 60 years ago when I asked a librarian at the British Library for Arab cookbooks. He told me to come back next day when he would have found something for me. There was nothing contemporary, but he gave me a handwritten list of publications he could show me on medieval Arab gastronomy. One was a 1939 translation of a 13th century culinary manual found in Baghdad by Professor Arbery. He had added poems of the time celebrating food. Another was an analysis of a culinary manuscript of the same period found in Damascus by the French Marxist orientalist Maxime Rodinson when he was stranded there in, in Damascus uh, with the French army during the Second World War. He used it to explain a court cuisine and a society that uh, existed more than 700 years before. It became his PhD thesis. There was also a Spanish translation from the Arabic of a Maghrebi Andalusian culinary manuscript. I was enthralled. I started to entertain friends to medieval banquets. <laughs> Many of the dishes had similar names, similar combinations of the ingredients and spices, and similar techniques. And those I was hearing from people of uh, than those that I was hearing from people leaving Egypt. I was thrilled to find a recipe like the one my aunt Regine gave me for treya, chicken with pasta flavored with a mix of spices, and it had the same name as the one in Damascus in the Damascus manuscript. Actually, uh, this recipe was. Uh, taken up by, by Nigella Lawson in, a telev in her first television series. And she said uh, it came from the Book of Jewish Food, and um, uh, she said it was one of her favorite recipes. So there it's how food passes now, not just doesn't take 100 years to come, <laughs> but it comes quite quickly. Uh, now, it may, all this made me feel that my family had extended roots into an exciting imagined past. When I told a cousin in Paris that I found Maxime's medieval study, uh, he said Maxime was a friend of his and he was coming to London. Actually, my cousin was Eric Rouleau, the journalist uh, who specialized in the Middle East. Now, so when Maxime came to London, I invited him to dinner and I cooked several dishes that featured in the Damascus manuscript to please him. He said he didn't like this kind of food at all. <laughs> he disliked courgettes and, or, and aubergines and he didn't like lamb and he didn't like the spices or any of the flavor. <laughs> so 
but he, and he explained that he was born into a communist working class Russian Jewish family in Paris. And his tastes, he said, were formed then. He said he liked the things like lungs, for instance, the kind of thing the poor once ate in Paris. Now, when my three children left home all at the same time, I decided to leave on the same day. I couldn't bear to stay at home alone and to travel all around the Mediterranean in search of food. I went à l'aventure. I tasted everything I could and asked everybody I met what they ate, what region they came from, what their parents and grandparents did and cooked. It gave me a reason to accost people <laughs> in a pension, in a restaurant, on a bench, and to engage them in conversation. People were glad to talk about their food to a stranger. In, that, in those days, it was very unusual for people to go and, and accost people about food. Nowadays, what I hear from all my young colleagues, everybody's doing it. I mean, they go and accost all the vendors in Marrakesh, or everywhere, uh, asking them for the recipe as well. Well, uh, the kind of experience I would have uh, on a train in Italy, for instance, I asked a woman sitting near me <clears throat> what her favorite dishes were, and could she give me the recipe, and how she cooked them. Soon, the whole carriage was coming round uh, from other parts of the train, and they were saying, that's not how I cook it, <laughs> you see. So I, was, I just wondered there, at that time, if I would ask somebody in, in London on a train or in uh, how, what they cook, they would think I was mad and move away. But I think nowadays it's not like that and maybe people will all come and say, that's how I cook it, because things have changed. Now, I started with a few contacts and was introduced and passed on to others. People in Marrakesh said, I have a cousin in Fez, one in Casablanca, do you want to go there? I was often invited home to watch people cook, sometimes by strangers. There's a certain intimacy in the kitchen that you don't have when you are entertained in the living room, when it's quite formal. We exchange personal stories. Uh, now, this is an advice to anthropologists who want people to speak to them, <laughs> go in their kitchen rather than in the living room. <laughs> part of the pleasure of researching food for me has been getting to know people, being part of their lives for a moment, and enjoying the special conviviality around food. I ate glorious dishes and discovered a world where I felt at home. And the Mediterranean became the focus of my work ever since. The countries around the Mediterranean are very different. There are forests and deserts, mountains, bays, and islands with different histories and cultures, Eastern and Western, Christian and Muslim. But the regions bordering the sea have a lot in common, often more, often more in common with each other than with other regions in their own countries. When you drive towards the sea, it feels at a certain point that you've opened a door into another world. The sky is different, the light and colors are different, the vegetation and architecture are different, and there is a certain way of being and living that is familiar. I can say sometimes the way to smile, the jokes you have, all kinds of things that, well, it's, I won't describe now, that you recognize. The Mediterranean climate allows for an easygoing outdoor life, for alfresco eating, food festivals, street foods, and markets. You see sim similar produce, olive oil, olives, all these things in the markets, preserves, goats and sheep's cheeses, charcuterie, great bundles of herbs, piles of spices, the same fruit and vegetables, and seafood, and the same meat cuts, all the offals as well. Also, you see clay pots, pestles and mortars, skewers. The custom of, uh, well, the kind of ways of, of eating 
is also similar. The custom of serving an assortment of little dishes with drinks is a feature of life. And a meal is a place of interaction where people talk and it's convivial. Now, Spaniards say their Mediterranean regions are an area of alegría de vivir. Unfortunately, it's not exactly joie de vivre at the moment. Every country has its own cuisine, and there are differences between town and country, and from one town and village to another. But you can see similar dishes from one end of the Mediterranean to the other. The brandade of salt cod in, Ve in Venice is the same as that of Provence and Catalonia. The chicken cooked with grapes of Spain is the same as one in Tuscany. The octopus stews of Greece and Provence are the same. There are broad bean purees everywhere and aubergine purees as well. <clears throat> A tomato sauce with fried onions and garlic is the signature tune of the entire Mediterranean. It's really, uh, for me, uh, I've, I, well, it's the incestuous history with the same occupiers and settlers from the Phoenicians, Greeks, and Romans to Arabs and Ottomans and many other things, as well as an intense maritime traffic and trading activity between all the port cities that shaped the cuisines around the sea. Uh, so, well, every little bit for me, what is interesting was that every little bit of the Mediterranean has its own culinary stories. Italy's great regional diversity is a legacy of the country's division until unification a century and a half ago into many independent foreign states, each with its own history, culture, and cooking tradition. Italian food is also <clears throat> an example of the way cooking reflects life as it was once lived. Because that's why I was asking everybody, what did your parents do? What did your grandparents do? Uh, many, many of the people I lived said that uh, they were from families of 10 uh, and who lived on the land. Actually, um, <clears throat> so many people said they were a family of 10, but they only wanted one child. <laughs> uh, and uh, while I was there, I was listening on the radio, and, and there was a, uh, always, at that period, program saying it was becoming a country of singles. People wanted to stay single <laughs> because they had enough of all these 10 children families. But, well, no, because then they became hugely nostalgic of the 10 children families. <clears throat> In Tuscany, until the 1960s, before peasants abandoned the land for factories, a system of sharecropping prevailed by which peasant farmers lived on estates as tenants and cultivated the land, giving half the produce to the landlord as rent. Estates were large and divided into fields each housing a family community. Peasants were busy all the year growing wheat, maize, or rice, vegetables and fruit. Wine was made on every estate, and in many also olive oil. I have to say neither the wine nor the olive oil was any good. <laughs> it's great now, but that's what they all told me. But every farm kept pigs, rabbits and poultry, and bred a few calves. They made cheers, cheese and cured pork. Uh, when the system <clears throat> of sharecropping was abolished and landowners found themselves without workers, they sold their properties cheap to people from Milan and Rome and to foreigners who used the farmhouses as holiday homes. Entrepreneurs from the north came to farm in a modern, intensive way with tractors and machinery. Thank you. The old agriculture of intermingled vines, mulberries, and olive trees on the hill slopes. It is called promiscuous agriculture, uh, with little patches of wheat, maize, and pulses, where the large families of tenants had spent their days fighting their way through the entanglements to pick everything by hand, were replaced by a single crop industrial agriculture. 
country life changed dramatically, uh, but the, drastically, but the dishes that were born in the old life never disappeared, and they are now very much in fashion. A few small farmers continue in the archaic way of varied mixed, um, mixed cultivation, and their bit of landscape has remained like the background in Renaissance paintings. <clears throat> Spaniards, like Italians, are passionate about their cuisines and passionate about their terroirs. The late Catalan writer, José Pla, has a beautiful way of describing cooking. He said it was the landscape in a saucepan. He was talking about Catalonia, which has many very distinctive styles of cooking, of the sea, of the mountains, and, va and of the valleys, as well as the cooking of the Barcelona bourgeoisie, who I must admit is more French than Spanish. But the ghosts of the past are also there in the saucepans and on the plates. Spanish food is full of clues about the country's past. But when I told Peter, people I was researching the history of their food, hoping to get some information about what they thought was the history of their food, uh, whereas in Italy people love telling stories about how a dish came to be, in Spain I realized that it was a very sensitive subject. An olive oil producer in Cordoba volunteered that there had been a long controversy about Spanish culture. Was it Roman or was it Arab? After a lot of argument, he said, it was decided that it was Roman. At a dinner in Madrid, the hostess Antonieta said, you have to know, Claudia, that we are of Roman and Visigoth stock. She was angry, she said, at the way foreigners always, noted, always notice Moorish architecture. Did you see the Roman aqueduct in Segovia? <laughs> For centuries, the country had wiped out its Muslim and Jewish past from national memory. But now the legacies of the once huge populations of Muslims and significant minority of Jews had become a matter of interest and fascination, fascination to chefs. When I visited El Molino, a restaurant and center of gastronomic research outside Granada, where they hold courses on the history of Spanish food, I asked about its origins. What did they say? And, and I was told, Arab and Jewish. And I asked for an example. They gave roast pork. And, that, and then they explained, when they converted to Christianity, they cooked pork in the way they cooked lamb, which was to rub it with cumin seeds. Now, once I went and had the roast belly of pork at Fino's, and there are cumin seeds in the crackling, in the cuts. So now you know why cumin seeds are there, because they are never anywhere else in pork. Uh, but when I ate berenjena con miel, fried aubergines with honey in the town of Priego de Cordoba, the chef came and sat with me and I asked him about it. And he told me about Ziryab, a Kurdish lute player from the court of Harun al-Rashid in Baghdad, who joined the court of Cordoba and introduced new music and also new ways of cooking. Other chefs in Andalusia also mentioned Ziryab, as did flamenco musicians. Priego is on the Ruta del Califato, the tourist route of Muslim Spain. So a few restaurants are bringing out the old dishes uh, that have, uh, well, Moorish, as they call it, Moorish uh, influence. Now there's another tourist uh, route in Spain, it's the Camino Sefarad through areas once in, inhabited by Jews before their expulsion in 1492. Some of my ancestors came from Spain. My grandmother, Eugenie Alfondari, who was from Istanbul, 
spoke a medieval Spanish called Ladino with her friends. Their names were Toledano, Cuenca, Carbona, Leon, Burgos, Curiel. Their dishes had Spanish names, and they believed that their ancestors had brought them from Spain. The way people cooked in Spain, the ingredients they put together, their little tricks, their turn of hand, so many things were to me mysteriously familiar. A flavor and aroma triggered memories and emotions I never knew I had. It's surprising how dishes can appeal directly to the emotions. Food, like music, can touch you and make you cry. In December, I was in Amsterdam for the awards ceremony. I'm sorry I'm going from one place to another, but it seemed to, exp to work into what I wanted to say about culture. Now, in December, I was in Amsterdam for the awards ceremony of the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development. I had written the laudation for Kamal Muzawak, an, an, an entrepreneur and food activist in, from Lebanon. He calls himself a food activist, but now a lot of people are food activists, who started a movement that helps small-scale farmers and artisans, runs farmers' markets and food festivals, as well as educational programs for schools and catering courses for refugees. In his little Beirut restaurant called Taulet, each day a different home cook, usually a woman from a different part of Lebanon, prepares the specialities of her region and community. There are now other Taulets, a few other Taulets, that operate in the same way I have opened elsewhere in Lebanon. I receive their menus every week by email from Kamal. I met Kamal when we were both judges in a couscous competition in San Vito Lo Capo in Sicily. Now, the joint winners were a Palestinian and an Israeli. And they were called up in front of television by a B-list actress uh, and, and a whole lot of music to hold up the trophy together. Everyone was happy. Now, uh, Kamal was my host when I was researching the food in Lebanon. He took me on excursions to visit artisan producers in mountain villages. He stopped, we stopped in Zahle, in the Bekaa Valley, where, according to legend, the special character of the Lebanese Meze was born. I was a guest on his TV program with two Palestinian women from a refugee uh, camp. From an, uh, or, they had an organic peasants cooperative in the south of the country. They brought baskets full of fresh produce, including lentils, on the plant and wild herbs uh, and, uh, and, and wild plants of different kinds as well. And they also brought specialties for us to taste. A borgol salad with their homemade tomato paste, a porridge of wheat and yogurt. Lebanon is a tiny country with many different ethnicities, religions, cultures, Sunni and Shiite. Muslim, Druze, Syrian, Christian, Maronite, Greek Orthodox, Armenian, still hostile and suspicious of each other after their long and devastating civil war. But it is also a country with strong traditions of hospitality and conviviality, where gastronomy is an important part of culture and cooking tradition, uh, all linked with identity, history, and culture. Uh, well, um, being Kamal, uh, around Kamal, well, I have to say that Kamal uses that uh, for, as his inspiration. He uses all these factors and, and, and uh, these characteristics for his own mission. Now, being around him was an extraordinary lesson about the power of food to bring people together and make them feel loved and valued, to celebrate identity at the same time as build bridges. The farmers' markets are places where people from different ethnicities, religions, and classes socialize without fear of violence, and where farmers get a fair price 
while forming ties with each other and their customers. The Taulet restaurants celebrate the culinary diversity of Lebanon and bring people from embattled uh, and marginalized communities together. Kamal's message is make food not war. It is politics through gastronomy in a revolutionary kind of way. At the gala dinner in Amsterdam, attended by the Dutch royal family, Syrian women refugee, who were refugees in Lebanon and in Holland, cooked part of the gala dinner for 300 people. They made dishes like kibbeh stewed with quince, the kind of dishes that you don't get on standard restaurant menus. There was great excitement in the kitchen and they got a standing ovation. Is that what you call uh, when people clap, when the chefs have eaten at the end, they got a standing of ovation. Now, a year ago in February, I attended another gala dinner at the Chiran Palace in Istanbul. Now that was to celebrate the invitation by UNESCO to the city of Gaziantep to, to be part of their creative cities network in the field of gastronomy. Despite what the city is going through with possibly 400,000 Syrian refugees in their midst and ISIL fighters passing in and out, it had just inaugurated an institute of gastronomy. The mayor of Gaziantep said they wanted to protect their famous gastronomy and that their institute, at their institute they taught women disabled people and Syrian refugees how to cook professionally. Women are not normally accepted in the all-male professional kitchens of Turkey. Erdogan was there. He spoke loudly about the terrorist threat and Turkey's enemies. There had just been a bomb. Uh, he praised Gaziantep for sheltering so many refugees and congratulated them for their gastronomy but he said that many other histories in Turkey uh, also had great food. We were served uh, uh, dishes of Gaziantha. They are very like those of Aleppo, but very hot with lots of chili pepper. The city was once part of Syria. My great grandfather was a young rabbi there before he became chief rabbi of Aleppo. Gaziantep is the capital of Baklava. By the way, when I was there, I said that my, my uh, um, rabbi, my uh, great-grandfather was a rabbi there. And so I have been invited to come and, and inaugurate the synagogue. Oh, it's already been refurbished, but they needed to do an event. But, and to bring my, my family along. Now, during the sit dinner, I was sitting next to Charles Perry, an American who writes about medieval Medi Middle Eastern foods. Three pastry makers from Gaziantep came to thank him for the articles he wrote about them in the LA Times 20 years ago. They still had it pasted up. <laughs> then someone came to say that Erdogan wanted to speak to Charles. We were all just sort of wondering. And he put on a tie, somebody lent him a tie. When he came back, he said that Erdogan asked him, do you like baklava? <laughs> now, in 2010, uh, food was officially recognized by UNESCO as part of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. When they put the gastronomic meal of, friend, of the French on their list, they then added traditional Mexican cuisine, a Japanese cuisine, and the Mediterranean diet. Diet, here me, they mean everything around food, as endangered cultural treasures that needed valuing and safeguarding. I have to say something, a little secret, that it was the, the Catalan, my Catalan friends, who have been lobbying for years to have their list of recipe, Catalan recipes um, included in the intangible uh, um, um, heritage, cultural heritage of UNESCO. But Spain has cont continually stopped them. And so 
they started lobbying instead for the Mediterranean diet <laughs> because they feel very much that Catalonia was the queen of the Mediterranean in, in, in the medieval times. But for a long time, it continued to have a huge influence as a, as a trading uh, nation. But also, it is they who introduced the, uh, the tomato sauce, fried onions and garlic. Uh, well, in the last 30 years, the Mediterranean area has seen the reason why it's endangered and needs some safeguarding is that in the last 30 years, the Mediterranean area has seen dramatic changes in social and economic structures. The industrial industrialization of agriculture and food production, and also globalization. Once people cooked what their parents cooked, and recipes and techniques were passed from mother to daughter. Today, even in Italy, mama no longer spends all day cooking in the kitchen and Italians search on the internet for recipes, like they do here. Now, cuisine, traditional cuisine, are a fragile living heritage that can easily be lost. But does it matter if traditional cuisines are lost? Well, I've been thinking about that. In most countries, it matters for tourism, since part of the pleasure today of visiting a country is the local food. It matters to economies because countries can make easily, can more easily sell their traditional products. It matters to the world because of the loss of cultural diversity. It matters to the local inhabitants because it reinforces their identity and gives them pride and dignity. Even the most avant-garde chefs in various nouvelles uh, who, who do who practice various nouvelle cuisines, who deconstruct and create new dishes. Now, they are saying they are inspired by their mother's cooking and traditional cuisines, by their roots and history, and they use local products, local ingredients. When I interviewed the late revered, <coughs> revered Catalan chef, Santi Santa Maria, he said, Cooking has to be about sentiment as well as technique, and that without ideology, it is simply a matter of manual skills and technology. His ideology, he said, was rooted in the life of his peasant family and the progressive politics of his youth. He quoted the painter Juan Miro to be universal. He, uh, Miro had said, you have to be local. The reference points of, of uh, Santi Santa Maria, uh, uh, of his cooking, he said, were the memories of his grandparents' generation and medieval Catalan cookbooks. A lot of chefs say, said they looked at old cookbooks. And in Spain and in Italy, too, they look at medieval cookbooks, but more so in Spain. Now, food in Spain is about local patriotism. During the Franco regime, regional cultures were suppressed and artisan products were discouraged in favor of mass industrial ones uh, that could feed the population cheaply. When people felt free to celebrate their regional heritage, organizations formed to preserve their culinary heritage by recording recipes. 900 recipes were collected in Catalonia 600 in the Balearic, Balearic Islands of Mallorca and Menorca, 900 in Galicia, and so on. And producers rushed to obtain denomination de origin, denomination of origin for their wines, their olive oils, their hams, their charcuterie, their cheeses, their beans, their honeys, their lentils, their cows, their pigs, and capons. Uh, now, come to us. The way we cook and eat in Britain has changed for the better. When I first came to London in the 50s and 60s, well, it was limited and plain. It was also a taboo subject that caused embarrassment. Being a chef ranked as the lowest type of job. 
The only time families went out to dinner in a restaurant was to celebrate a birthday. Now interest in food has exploded. <coughs> Cooking is glamorous, chefs are venerated, eating out is one of the most popular leisure activities, and cooking competitions are the most watched television programs. We have a new, exciting and vibrant food scene with passionate cooks and artisans and a social elite that has become connoisseurs of food and wine. The majority, however, however live on ready-cooked meals, granted they're better than they were before, and on fast food. Now, we have an, our culinary culture, our elite culinary culture, is a global culture. It's innovative and subject to constantly changing fashions. Chefs are the driving force that create fashions, and inspiration comes from California, Spain, Norway, Italy, and our own ethnic cuisine. Once, grand restaurants were safe if they offered French cuisine. Now, they have to keep abreast with what is fashionable. And food producers are on the lookout for the next big thing, which also has to be organic, sustainable, ethical, seasonal, and healthy. I won't say clean. <laughs> we follow the fashions, and we try to cook like chefs. We adopt superfoods and forage foods, and we are concerned with health and weight. Now, vegetarianism and veganism are main mainstream. But the last global trends, it seems, are to revalue home cooking and our mother's cooking and to cherish regional cuisine. It's a response to globalization and it has to do with nostalgia for an old life and a fear of losing cultural identity. By the way, those Italian internet sites that I've looked at are full of people's grandma's recipes. And sometimes you see a video of grandma cooking. Now, as cookery writers, we are used to being asked, not me, but everybody else is here, <laughs> asked to send recipes that are original and different. Now, lately, we're asked to, for our mother's recipes, and I keep being asked for my mother's. I've run out of them. <laughs> and to describe our childhood kitchens and their smells. Now, romantic nostalgia has a smell. In Sp Spain, it is the smell of chorizos, hanging in attics and in kitchens. In much of the Mediterranean, it's of the tomato, onions, and garlic, frying in olive oil. For me, the smells of crushed coriander and garlic frying in oil, and also the mingled <laughs> smells of chicken, turmeric, lemon, and garlic. Well, that was my mother's chicken sofrito on Friday night. When people phoned to book uh, a 250 pound tasting menu at Heston Blumenthal's Fat Duck, they are now asked you to they are now ask you to name dishes remembered from your childhood so that they can personalize your dinner and take you back to your childhood before whisking you into the future. Now, can any of you afford to see what they make of your memories? Now, have you noticed, just to end, that now food is associated with love. Many products are said to be made with love. In America, a pot of yogurt I got was said to be made with love from milk, from cows of a special breed raised with love on fresh grass. Now, that was something. Now, just I picked up today from Marks and Spencer's new spring promotion is entitled Made with Love. Their gastropub seafood casserole, their beef bourguignon, their beetroot ravioli, their sishu, all of these are made with love. Now, I have to tell you, what you cook yourself for somebody that you care about 
for your friends is a great way of really showing love. I recently participated in a Dutch three-part uh, three TV series um, entitled Love in Times of Turmoil. I was filmed making food for asylum seekers with volunteers at the West London Synagogue, which they do every Saturday. We all sat together at long tables. It was hard, we, we ended up sitting there. It was really heartening to see, the, to see the love the volunteers put into their cooking and a pleasure and moving to see how their spiced lentil soup, vegetable couscous and yogurt cake were appreciated. Actually, we got a standing ovation. <laughs> of course, food can also be used to coerce and discriminate, to emphasize differences and ethnicity, religion and social status, and to separate one group from another. In France recently, when schools in areas where local councils were dominated by the Front National, they refused to offer an alternative meat dish when pork was on the menu. So it was seen as Islamophobic and anti-Semitic. Now, just the, my last word is, there is an Arab saying, if you have shared food with someone, you can never betray them as you have sealed your relationship before God. There is something about eating together that creates a bond. It can be used to create community. Thank you. Now I went too fast. No. <laughs> uh, Claudia, thank you. That was an absolute tour de force. I'm, I'm tasting like mad. Uh, from uh, talking about uh, childhood days, uh, right through your travels, through so many extraordinary uh, countries, but also linking that uh, to some very contemporary issues in terms of migration, uh, refugees and that sense of loss uh, which people partly try to deal with uh, in terms of uh, sharing food and recipes. So thank you very much for an extraordinary uh, lecture and can I invite everyone to join us uh, upstairs for our reception but before you do that let's give another rounding. Uh,